On the 5th of November, millions of voters in the United States will cast their ballot to elect their next president. However, there's a catch. The world's oldest democracy does not hold elections which can be considered as the easiest to understand. In fact, the American voting system is quite complicated. Now, most democracies in the world follow something that's called the popular vote, where voters directly cast their ballots to a political party or leader. It's a direct transfer of the vote from the voter to whoever is on the ballot. But the United States does not follow this. In fact, it's the only democracy in the world that has an indirect voting system called the Electoral College. Simply put, the Electoral College is a process of voting. It's not really a college. It was established in 1787 AD and was included in the US Constitution by the Founding Fathers. The Electoral College is basically the selection of electors who are called delegates. On the 5th of November, when Americans will queue up to vote, they won't actually be voting for their next president. Instead, they'll actually be voting for delegates who represent their respective states, and these delegates will then vote for the president. So, how does the Electoral College work? The Electoral College is made up of 538 delegates. You must be wondering where the number 538 comes from. It's the number of senators and representatives from each of the 50 states. The breakdown of 538 includes exactly 100 senators, two from each state, and 438 representatives from the 50 states. Each state's number of representatives is based on its population. Let's take a closer look with an example. California and Texas are the two most populous states, and so they have a higher number of representatives. However, regardless of the population of the states, each of them gets three votes to start with. The remaining are then added depending on the population of the state. However, that does not mean that the states with a higher population enjoy more voting rights. In fact, it can be quite the opposite. Let's take the example of two states. The population of Texas is over 29 million. On the other hand, Alaska has a much smaller population of just above 700,000. However, each representative from Texas and Alaska roughly represents the same proportion of the population. So, as Texas gets 38 representatives in the US Congress, Alaska gets three. And this makes voting different in Texas and Alaska, because each of the 38 delegates from Texas now represent roughly over 760,000 people. Meanwhile, each delegate from Alaska represents over 250,000 people. Basically, it takes 760,000 people from Texas to get one vote, but it just takes 250,000 people from Alaska to get that same one vote. So the vote in Alaska can be considered a lot more influential. When Americans go to polls in November, they aren't exactly voting for the president directly, but their state's representatives, whether that's Democrat or Republican. And then, these delegates give their votes to the presidential candidate from their party. Whichever candidate then wins the majority in a state, no matter how big or small it may be, wins all the electoral votes of that state. And in total, to win the race to the Oval Office, a candidate must win 270 and more votes across 50 states. So when Americans say this, I love her. I am so glad to see um, a presidential nominee who is youthful and joyful, and I think that reflects right back onto the, uh, the Democrat. Uh, my first time voting in a presidential election, and I, I, I could not be happier. I don't know the exact numbers, but I know the last election, I think Trump got like 88 or 90 percent of the vote here. I think he's going to get that again. The courts will take care of that. Let's take care of him in November. <laughs> what they really mean is that they will vote for the delegates who represent their political party. And then, those delegates will vote for the presidential candidate from their respective parties. Kamala, you are fired! You're fired! Get out! Get out! It's time to turn the page. However, the delegates don't have to necessarily vote for the candidate that the population wants to give its vote to. In fact, electors are free to vote against the wishes of the people. And this is despite having been elected as a delegate by the voters. So, with how complex the electoral system is, should the US continue with it or adapt the much simpler popular voting system?
Lobbying. Lobbyists. 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 You've probably heard of them before. They're kind of a go-to villain in modern politics. But what exactly are lobbyists? And more importantly, are they really buying our government out from under us? Mm, yeah, yeah, they really are. And here's five ways they're doing it. Number one. So, if you're a politician, you have to raise an obnoxious amount of money just to run for office. And one of the easiest ways to raise that kind of cash is by turning to lobbyists. Alright, so here's how it works. Let's say you are a big bank. Now, you want to get a senator on the banking committee to vote your way on an upcoming bill. So, the easiest thing you could do would be to just, like, you know, bribe him. I mean, you could give $100,000 directly to his re-election campaign, nice and clean. But, unfortunately for you, that is super illegal. I think. I hope. Yep, still super illegal. So instead, you're gonna hire yourself a lobbying firm to serve as the middleman for what would in any sane universe basically just be a bribe. Your lobbyist can legally organize a swanky fundraiser that brings in $100,000 for the senator's re-election campaign, and at that fundraiser, your lobbyists can just happen to have a friendly chat with the senator's staff about your feelings on banking policy. At the end of the day, the senator is still up $100,000, he still knows exactly where that $100,000 came from, and he knows which way to vote if he wants the money to keep on flowing. But this time, nobody's broken any laws. Pretty sweet scam, right? This is a hugely common practice, and it helps explain the next item on our list. Number two. So, in many cases, lobbyists actually write our laws. Literally. For example, let's take a look at the 2014 omnibus budget deal. Now, Congress used this deal to secretly put taxpayers back on the hook to bail out banks that engage in risky derivatives trading. Yes, derivatives. You might remember them from such things as, uh, causing the 2008 financial crisis, nearly destroying the economy of the United States, and almost causing Western civilization to fold in on itself. So yeah, that, that happened. Now, 70 of the 85 lines that put taxpayers back on the hook for these derivatives trades were cut and pasted word for word from model legislation that was drafted by Citigroup lobbyists. Citigroup, quite literally, wrote its own rules. And this isn't just a problem with the big banks. Like, just last week we reported on how lobbyists for the chemical industry may have authored an entire portion of a bill that shuts down efforts to crack down on toxic chemicals. This kind of behavior happens every single day. Number three. So, lobbyists routinely offer members of Congress and their staffers lucrative jobs at their firms or their clients' companies once they leave office. This practice is often called the revolving door, and it works like this. When we would become friendly with an office and they were important to us, uh, I would say, or my staff would say to him or her at some point, you know, when you're done working on the Hill, we'd very much like you to consider coming to work for us. Now, the moment I said that to them, that was it. We owned them. And what does that mean? Every request from our office, every request of our clients, everything that we want, they're gonna do. Yeah, just let that, let that sink right in. This practice has become crazily common. In the 1970s, less than 5% of retiring legislators went on to become lobbyists. Now, half of all retiring senators and a third of retiring House members do. And it's hard to overemphasize how tempting a revolving door gig can be. Congressmen who go on to become lobbyists get, on average, a 1,452% raise. 1,400%! I mean, can you imagine what that kind of raise would do for you at, say, your job? Number four. So, thanks to loopholes and how federal law defines what a lobbyist actually is, many elected officials go on to take what are effectively revolving door lobbying jobs without ever having to officially register as lobbyists. Now, researchers estimate that there's actually twice as much lobbying as what's publicly disclosed. That makes lobbying a $7 billion a year industry. And it means that only half of the people who are being paid to influence our elected officials are required to follow what few rules there actually are. Number five. So, possibly the most upsetting part of all of this is how ridiculously effective lobbying is. One study found that for every dollar a company spends on lobbying, it gets $220 back in tax savings. I mean, that's crazy. That is a 22,000% return on investment. And it works really well for both sides of the aisle, which is why top lobbying firms raise big money for both Republicans and Democrats, usually at the same time. Like, right this second, there is a lobbying firm in D.C. called Aiken Gump. Its roster is full of former members of Congress, and its clients include massive companies like the Chamber of Commerce, Monsanto, Boeing, and foreign governments like the United Arab Emirates and Japan. And Aiken Gump lobbyists are, as we speak, holding fundraisers for presidential candidates like Hillary Clinton, Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, and John Kasich. They all work together. So, all this begs a pretty obvious question. Why don't we just ban lobbying altogether? Well, constitutionally, we can't, and we really shouldn't. Lobbying itself isn't inherently evil. Like, the act of lobbying is just advocating a position to an elected official, and that's not the problem. It's protected by the First Amendment for a good reason. People need to be able to make a case to their elected representatives, even if they can't be there in person. The problem is that lobbyists are routinely using money, favors, gifts, and lucrative job offers to do the convincing for them. Put more simply, you can lobby 
lobby and you can donate money to a politician, but you should not be allowed to do both at the same time. It's like handing the referee 50 bucks before the game starts and $50,000 right after. So what is lobbying? Well, simply, lobbying is the act of influencing decisions made by legislators and regulatory agencies. You know, the guys who make the rules. And the people who exert this influence are called lobbyists. Well-connected professionals with slick suits and slicker tongues. Lobbyists tend to be experts in the fields they lobby for. They advise lawmakers on how to make sure Americans are getting the most benefit from the laws they pass, while also reducing potential harm. It's a good idea. Why wouldn't you want an expert's advice? Here's where things get screwy. Sometimes the lawmakers decide the cash is greener on the other side, so they become lobbyists themselves. They leave government and join a private company, taking their connections and influence with them. This phenomenon is called the revolving door. People going from regulating an industry to working in that same industry, and sometimes back and forth multiple times. Corporations love having such powerful people on their payroll, so they do everything they can to lure them over. And for their part, the regulators help out by making a few choice laws to benefit their future employers. And with the spin of the door comes a host of new laws that benefit some companies, hinder others, but business keeps rolling, and in the end, no one really gets hurt. Except, of course, the people. You'll see members of Congress who will take on issues defending one particular special interest and then go out to work for that special interest after they leave. And the same is true of all government agencies. In fact, that's considered the normal way to do business in Washington. Big government and big business essentially are the same, are they not? What's the difference between a corporation and a government agency when the corporation buys the politicians with campaign donations and the politicians uh, do as they're told in passing laws that the corporation would have passed had the corporation been the government. Sadly, this phenomenon is all too common today and it's not specific to just one industry. Rather, it seems that many of the agencies which have the power to influence our daily lives are corrupted by the revolving door. When you have delegated power to committees and government officials and agencies uh, to regulate the economy, uh, it always leads to corruption. It's too tempting for people not to use that power for their own personal agendas. And the revolving door is merely proof of the fact that when you give government and its agencies the power to regulate commerce, it always, always will lead to corruption. Nine-tenths of all federal law is not the product of those we elect but rather the product of the unelected heads of these bureaucratic agencies. So we do not have a limited federal republic in the United States. What we have instead is an unlimited bureaucratic oligarchy in which these bureaucratic agencies operate largely without any accountability. This isn't a representative form of government. They only represent the most powerful and the people who give them the most amount of money. The corporations, the multinationals, have taken over. Whether it's agriculture, whether it's broadcasting, whether it's pharmaceutical, whether it's retail, you name the field, a few control it all. Mm. Welcome back to my channel. Okay, let's get into this one right here. Yep, you heard it right. You cannot vote a president in office or elect a president into office if you are a citizen if you are a citizen the citizens only get the popular vote which we'll talk about in a minute the delegates of each state <laughs> these are the people that get the vote that eventually vote the president into the United States right the citizens, the people, they get the popular vote, which is a feel-good vote. So before we go any further, again, this is in the Constitution, and this is the law. Anybody telling you that your vote counts to elect a president into office, either they're lying, they're misinformed, or they don't know what the hell they are talking about. Or they're gatekeepers. And there's a lot of gatekeepers. There's no reason to gatekeep. There's no reason to lie. If that's the law. The law is the law. It's been like that since the uh, 
what the war of independence the declaration of independence the constitution the citizens cannot vote <laughs> the president into office and in that's why it's two different votes a popular vote which is a feel-good vote and then you got the electoral college and only the delegates of each state are in it what don't you get furthermore <laughs> this is the number one thing people need to realize also in the law right they came up with something where they can do what have lobbyists as a third party for giving money from corporation to politician let me give it to you one more time they put a law in place where they because they didn't want corporations and companies organizations giving money straight to politicians so what they do they put a middleman in there it's called a lobbyist so these lobbyists work for the companies and corporations and they go in there and give them money the pop they give the politicians money the lobbyists funded by the corporations to pass the laws in favor of them you understand well most people understand this <laughs> what what, the, what what my saying is the rich get richer and the poor get dumber because the, the poor don't know the law the poor if you ever told them the law <clears throat> They'll still get mad. They'll still get frustrated and they won't want to acknowledge the law. They don't care. That you don't know this stuff. Because as a citizen, the law is there for everybody to see. They don't have to teach it in school. They don't have to tell you. You can go to any law library. You can look this stuff up, stuff up online. This is the law. Also, what is a president? What is a vice president? What is a department? What does it sound like? These are all corporations. The United States is a corporation. So these are corporations handing each other money. When King James came over here, when King George came over here, when all these kings came over here to the Americas, they came through corporate charters or they set corporate charters in different companies invested in the Americas. They had to pay people to come over here and start building their colonies. But you don't read, do you? <laughs> you don't read, do you? They call these people indentured slaves. Today, they call them Slaves from Africa. Right? It's a lot of money invested in keeping you dumb about history. About you not knowing the law of the land versus the laws in commerce, which are fictitious. So you can say anything in the world of commerce because it's fictitious. It's not a real reality. Right? It's made up. It's legal ease. Straw men. <laughs> we won't get too deep into that, people. Because people's not ready for the real truth. But this is like, you know, elementary, what we're talking about right here. And trust me, I'm not trying to say I'm the smartest dude. All I'm trying to tell you is that until I heard this from the BBC, I didn't know. And then I had to look it up and there it was. Your vote don't count. And this is another reason why the black community has went down the drain for a hot minute and they don't really have, have any representation 
in their community because the investors, right? The companies, the corporations that give money to these politicians, they're not investing in black people no more. We'll tell you where their investment is in a minute, but their investment has been on what? Giving money to the politicians to bring these immigrants in. It make crazy money off of these immigrants. You see it, right? These are the new indentured slaves. What did indentured slaves do? Well, they came over here from another country because their country was bad back in the day. When we talk about indentured slavery, right? They came from another country in hopes to have a better future for them and their children because everything was bad over there in Africa, Europe, the Middle East, Asia. These were your slaves that came. <laughs> your, your indentured slaves, right? We've already went over this. There was no real slavery until maybe uh, almost until the mid 1800s. We read this over and over and over again. If you go look it up, slavery is not being taught to people. Um, it really doesn't have to. It ain't been taught to people the way it really happened. But again, it doesn't have to. It's clear and plain what they're trying to tell you in movies and books and all this stuff in the world of commerce, which is fictitious. It didn't happen like that. It's a lie. And that's why you don't see these reparations pouring in. And if you don't watch out in the near future, those reparations are going to go to people who <laughs> I'm not going to say nothing. <laughs> we'll leave it right there. We'll leave it right there. Black people better start knowing their history because this, this reparation thing is going to backfire on them pretty soon or later. Because somebody's going to come along who wants to invest and make money in real history and tell the real history of what happened in America before the 1900s. Now, I can tell you something. The whole thing is told backwards. Who, who the kings was, who the queens was, who the real slaves was, who the real presidents was. I'll just leave it at that. But this whole thing on black Americans, if they don't wake up and read and go look at the history that's in front of them, you can't you can't miss it. It's been told by so many channels, so many, so many people. This this whole thing is going to backfire in your face one day about these reparations. You're best to find out who you really was, <laughs> who you really was. It's right there in history. Because they're not telling the real history. And people have been trying to tell black people for a hot minute now. I would guess about 10, 15 years now who they really are, but they won't accept it. Because it's mostly the men. The men don't want to wake up and be real men. They don't. So anyways, like I was saying, I'm not just trying to beat up on black people like that, but you got people, you don't have to believe me. All I got to say is don't believe anybody when they're saying all this stuff and they're not really your family. And this where most of, you know, a, a lot of these, when you come to the United States, you start to see there's no, there's no family structure here. There's no family. Everybody... Uh, uh, you're calling somebody on TV your family. You're believing somebody else's history and you're saying that's your 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 family and you're taking their side because they're on TV. You don't even get along with your own family, but you're saying some dude that got shot by the cops is part of you and you're going to write for this dude. You're going to take somebody else's history that they're telling you in a book in 18, 1751. You're going to say that's part of your people. Hmm. So you're taking on these people's story that you don't even know. You don't even know your own people in 1751, but you'll take on somebody else's story because their skin color. Hmm. This is what I suggest. If you got a last name, whether it's Johnson, McGee, Shelton, Washington, you best go find out who your family was. All you have to go do is look in the house of Surnames, those are your people. If you dumb enough to think slave masters gave you their surname, their family crest, you must be a damn fool. 
you must be a damn fool. No slave master would ever do such a thing. So what about the other slaves? He gave the whole damn plantation of slaves his last name. <laughs> Look, I, I try to be hard on my people because th they don't get it. They don't want to wake up. And a lot of people been trying to wake them up. But yeah, it's a lot of gatekeepers out here. So, yeah. What's been going on for a hot minute? The, the, the corporations, they're not invested in black people. Black Americans. I'm talking about foundational black Americans. They've been invested in immigrants. All the money they can make off of immigrants. It's big money. And like I was telling you, it is similar to slavery. So what happened to indentured service? So they came over here and it was working. And maybe had, they had a two-year contract, one-year contract, whatever like that. But most of these contracts, when they ended, they had money. Because it was getting paid if you go look at slave rolls. So when, when they came out of slavery, they had land, they had cows, they had money, and they started up their own little plantation. And got they got slaves. Or some of them just moved the hell on and, and didn't do that. Maybe they went to school. Maybe they um, did something else. Right? They, just, they just started a family. And they just worked on their own farm and provided for themselves. But either way, they moved on. And that's the thing with these people. The immigrants are coming and they work for a hot minute and then they move on and make money. So what happens next? Now they got to bring in more slaves. Right. To work for cheap. And then the cycle keeps going on and on and on. Because they keep moving on. They have no problem making it. In this society in the united states whether it's what we would say you know the economy's bad or it's good where they come from it would make the the average african-american if they had to stay there for a week and live in their conditions the, the normal american would be crying their eyes out come get me please help me <laughs> no hot water no air conditioner no mcdonald's no jordans no latest fashions on the regular none of that stuff no food stamps no welfare no wick Hmm. two to four dollars an hour for minimum wage and usually if you're not born in the wealth you never get it so the immigrants usually survive great here and the reason why is because they come from real bad upbringings not as far as like a people's when I'm talking about the economy and then they come over here husband and wife and they stay together and you see a lot of them, they don't even know damn English. And where do they go? They go for the blue collar jobs the men do. And the woman, she goes do, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, maybe a service job in a, in a restaurant or a factory or a, a grocery store. And they combine that money together and they're doing just good. Not going to one day <laughs> of this American school. They end up getting a nice house in a nice neighborhood. Some of them own businesses. You never want the one day of this school to know about this history. So we make this economy more harder than it is because most Americans, they separate and they go on their own and they make this thing a challenge and make it bad because you can't make it on your own out here. Rent is for two people. When they say rent is 1200 that's based on two people living in the house, not based on one person. Everything is based on two people because if they set it for one person, then those two, two people are going to have a, a far better advantage over everything. So the people who set the economy set it for two people, you know, can get a job and pay rent. But if you're out here on your own, you're paying rent for two people. You're paying food for two people. You're doing everything for two people. So that's why poor people, for the most part, don't make it in this economy. So the, the companies and corporations that run the United States, and this is the same thing wherever you go, basically, whatever country you go to. But in the United States where the companies and corporations 
run the United States through funding money to the politicians, they're not invested in the black community. They're invested in these immigrants, right? Because the immigrants will come over here and they'll work, either they'll work for nothing. To them, it's a lot of money. Or they'll claim self-contractor, which is, <laughs> a lot of them, that's illegal. I don't see how this is even possible. But there's laws that's, that's passed, so they can do it. And they claim self-contractor, where most of them don't even pay taxes. And I, I won't get too deep into it, but they're all working and getting paid by the job. So everything is getting done fast. And the companies and corporations is making money. Or they're working by the hour, some of them. But they're not really getting paid no more money. Look, man. Not getting paid a lot of money. And guess what? A lot of these people move on. It's not bad for them because they're here for the American dream. They're not here to <laughs> make that kind of money that I was talking about and do it forever. They move on to bigger and better things. Right? So this is where the investment is. It's not in American people, no matter what color it is. In general, it's on these immigrants. That's what the companies and corporations want. You see all these subdivisions getting built just like that. You see all these commercial buildings, Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's, Burger King, uh, strip malls, all this stuff. Buildings downtown getting built faster than you can damn blink, it seems like. It's because of these people. But again, they got to keep bringing them because they're not going to keep doing this for no money. So I will be surprised. Well, nothing surprises me really. <laughs> I would uh, it would be kind of weird to see Trump as president again. President of the United States Corporation that incorporated in 1871, the Act of 1871 eventually got rid of the money of the state. And now you got federal money, which is corporate money. United States Corporation runs the states. Remember, the states are a republic. In the republic in which I stand, in which we stand, one nation, the states are a republic. That happened after the War of Independence. This is not a democracy. Anybody tells you this is a democracy, they're a lie. The United States Corporation is a democracy. Remember, it's the United States of America. Remember, the Americas is the whole entire Western Hemisphere. So everybody born in the Western Hemisphere, no matter if it's in Dominican Republic, Mexico, El Salvador, Jamaica, Canada, all these people are Americans. You're in America. In the Americas, the United States, they came in 1871. It's in the District of Columbia and is a corporation. Right? They are their own country if you look it up. The states are republics. That's why they have their own flag. But the states sold the people out in 1932. Or 1933. Go look at the Act of 1933. They sold the people out. With the birth certificate. With the social security card. All this stuff. They sold the people out. Because the United States Corporation went bankrupt. They had no more money. Remember. The United States Corporation went around the world. In all these wars. Fighting all these people. Guam. Puerto Rico. Mexico. Um, you name it, all the Indian wars, hundreds of Indian wars. And by the time 1933 came, it wasn't just about the, the, the Great Depression in the stock market. No, the United States ended up going bankrupt. The corporation did. And guess what? They sold the people out. They told the people to get birth certificates and social security cards and sold the people out. The, the states did. The states sold the people out. The United States Corporation. If you want to read that story, 
You can look it up. And now you have federal debt money instead of state money backed by gold. That's what you got. Yeah, because the United States Corporation took all this money to go fight all these wars. Took all this money from the banks. And so, it doesn't matter who you vote for. We can see what the what they did, right? In 2020. Until 2024. <laughs> they put this economy in so much debt. It's on the, you can't even wrap your head around it. With the COVID, giving out all that money. <clears throat> to companies, basically the companies and corporations, <clears throat> depending on how big your company was, right? Some some regular people would get like ten thousand dollars, eighteen thousand dollars. You know, big companies would get like a hundred thousand or a million or a hundred million or two hundred million, and they didn't have to pay up none of this money back. At one point, Biden and the the, the Democrat administration was telling immigrants stop crossing the border to get these checks <laughs> stay at home register online <laughs> we'll send them over there wow <sighs> all these billions of dollars that gave out the the the, the countries hmm. people crossing the border FEMA spent all this money. I mean, they, they put this economy in so much debt that the people don't understand. Trump is not going to fix nothing. It's over. The inflation that these people have built up, the, 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 the Democrats, the last, the last four years, huh? You're going to be feeling that for the next 10 to 15 years. You haven't seen nothing. And on top of all these natural disasters that's been going on, I know that ain't their fault, but I'm just saying Trump won't be able to fix this. If it, <laughs> there's no way, there's no damn way he'll be able to fix this. He'll be able to put a wrench in it from getting worse. But you, we haven't even see, we haven't even seen the beginning of the inflation. This is nothing. This is nothing. We'll be feeling this for the next 10 to 15 years. What the Democrats did. They pretty much pooped on Americans, brought in all these people to help out these companies, corporations that funded their money to do so during their campaign. Because remember, when they pay for your campaign, when they're giving you money <laughs> to do something for them, if you're elected, guess what? You have to do something for them. That's why black people never have nothing being done for them, because there's no there's no companies and corporations giving the politicians money to do anything for the black community. Just 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 understand this. Imagine if you put these people together, right? Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Oprah Winfrey, Denzel Washington, you know, P. Diddy at one point before he's going through that thing. Dr. Dre got billions. All, all your black celebrities, all your black Hollywood sports players, some black investors. Why ain't they giving these politicians money to change these laws to invest in black people? want to <laughs> they don't want to they could the money has been invested where they can make an investment on prisons right hip-hop clothing maybe a record or a, a, a record corporation right where they put out rap music these black people these black celebrities with money and these black billionaires they're invested in those areas in the stock market. All the money is in immigrants. And it's been like that since the good 2000s. Immigrants and guess what? Now you take Americans out of the blue collar industry. Now their neighborhoods just disappear. And get gentrified. And now that's an investment in itself. Now you can start getting these houses. You, you, you remodel them with these immigrants. And guess what? 
You don't have to pay them no overtime, no workman's comp, none of that stuff. They're getting paid by the job or the day, so they're knocking it out that fast. And what do you got? Something that you never thought you would see back in the 80s, the 90s, maybe the early 2000s. White people and a lot of immigrants moving into the black community and taking it over. And some of them, it, 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 they're like right on the edge of where the hood still is. But they know these people be out like in five, five years. So you can vote if you want, but your vote don't count. They're telling why they so hard on black people voting. They don't make a big, you know, snot out of Asian people voting, Indians, Arabs, none of that. Right. Because these people, even if they don't vote, they're going to make it. They're going to make it. They, they don't need <laughs> they don't need somebody telling them that their vote counts. They can take care of themselves. This is easy for them. In the United States, where they come from, all you got to do is go to work, be a couple, save your money, do the right thing, don't break the law, and you're good to go. What's so interesting about the black vote that don't count <laughs> is that they're telling black people this because we talked about this. It's like an abused um, wife, right? The husband is saying after he done cheated on the wife and abused her. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're so beautiful. I love you. There's nobody like you. And then she takes them back. And then right back, right at the end of the four years, right before the four years come, or let's just say before she leaves again, about to leave again, I love you, baby. Um, I, 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 I don't know what got into me. You're the most beautiful thing in the world. Guess what? She takes them back. And the cycle just keeps going on and on and on. And this is real. There's women who actually do this. They get abused and abuse and abuse and they keep taking the man back and that's what it is for black people it's the uh, uh, abuse of uh, what, what is the word we want we looking for the the i don't know the word but or the phrase but that's what it is for the black community right right before the four years about to come up guess what Here the Democrats is again. I love you, baby. I don't know what got into me. I would never cuss at you again. I would never hit you again. You know, I don't know what got into me. You're the most beautiful thing in the world. These are the <laughs> these are the Democrats to the black community. And, and these are the people you would think they would be taken care of first. And it hasn't been like that, especially, you know, since um, what do you call it? Desegregation. Desegregation was about not just black and white people. It was about everybody getting together and buying and doing everything together, right? So before integration, I mean, desegregation, black people had their own things. Schools, um, automotive shops, tire shop, clothing stores, grocery stores, you name it. Black people had it. Go ask some people in the West, in the North. They was pissed at Martin Luther King. Like, what is you doing? Are you out of your mind? So that's what it was supposed to be. That's what they made it sound like it was going to be. Everybody was going to get together and consume off of everybody. You was going to go to black restaurants, buy off of them, black grocery stores, black tire shops, black clothing stores. Everybody was the Indians, the Arabs, the Latinos, the whites. Everybody was going to do business with each other. Well, <laughs> when the smoke cleared, that wasn't the case. Nobody wanted to do business with black people and black people weren't disciplined to say, hey, look, you're not doing business with our people. We're not going to do business with your people. And that's what that's basically what happened. And this is where you are today, where we are today. Um, that the Democrat Party hasn't taken care of the black community since desegregation. Except for welfare and, and programs, that's it. And we look at it, it's pretty sad to see immigrants come in from third world countries and not even live in the hood, which they would be living 10 times better than what they were living. But instead, they go to nice communities. They live better than a lot of black people in the black community. And the thing is, a lot of people, don't, I ain't saying just black people, a lot of poor whites too. They got this thing called credit. So these people, most of these immigrants come over here by the time they're over age, 18, 25, 30, 40 years old. And they come over here, credit's good. 
first time buyers can get everything like that meanwhile a lot of Americans got to grow up and struggle from their parents. They All they know is struggle. By the time they get like teenager, they mess. I mean, um, 18, they're messing up their credit. And the rest is history. The rest is history. These immigrants arrive, good credit. Let's go. They're already adults. They don't have like a kid mind. They're not going to go do bad things or do anything wrong. And that's how immigrants get ahead of a lot of Americans. Because they don't grow up in the pop culture. And... I'm not speaking nothing bad about immigrants. I'm just telling you the truth, I'm telling you the truth about the United States. So you can vote who you want to vote for. It's a feel good vote. Four years will pass. Whoever wins this one, four years, you will not be better off. People are lying. People are picking, think they're picking somebody based on how they feel. Everybody's going to get screwed. It don't matter who's in office one way or another. No matter who you pick, because you didn't get no money to the campaign. You're not part of the company and corporations. And that's who run everything. Trump is an actor. <laughs> and let me say this before I get off. For black people to actually never have one black president or one black vice president and call Obama and call Harris the first black president and first black vice president is the saddest thing in the world. Right? This is like <laughs> a Spanish person saying Indian people and I'm talking about let's just say Japanese let's just say Japanese Spanish people said that Japanese people were their people now are they, are they melanated are they mixed with black yes but these people aren't black they're biracial these people need to start calling themselves what they are they're Indian and black they're black and white they're not black these aren't this isn't the so-called slave days black people keep getting duped until they stop duking themselves out of reality, they never had anything in the Oval Office that was black. No black president, no black vice president. Stop duking yourself. Stop duking yourself. Tell me what you think.